I'm the principal investigator on a project called the Foundations of Animal Sentience Project. I'll just start by giving a quick advert for the project, you know, a quick explanation of what the project is, is about before moving on to today's topic. It's a five-year European Union funded project that is really structured around these big questions. How can we develop better methods to study the subjective experiences of animals scientifically? We have an empirical side to the project that is working with bees at Queen Mary in London. And how can we put the emerging science of animal sentience to work to design better policies, laws, and ways of caring for animals? And we've been doing a lot on, on both of these questions over the last two and a half years. If you want to find out more about what we've been doing, you can go to our project website, which has, is the link on the slides. And also, if you want to bring up these slides in a browser window, if some of them go, go past you a bit fast, if there's a bit too much text, you can go to bit.ly slash birchhot to bring up the slides in a in a browser window and then you can click through to, to some of the links that are in there as well. So we've been asking you know, how can we study the subjective experience of animals given ongoing uncertainty about its neural basis and functional profile. I've been writing various papers about that in, in philosophy and in science and, and my postdoc Andrew Crump has been heavily focused on this as well. And we've been asking too how can we make sense of variation in conscious states across the animal kingdom, given that really, in my view, it doesn't make much sense to describe one animal as more conscious than another. I don't think it really makes sense to say that a crow is more conscious than an octopus or that a rat is more conscious than a crow. I don't think the variation here is anything that can be squashed into a single dimension. So in this paper in Trends in Cognitive Sciences, with some collaborators, we proposed a multi-dimensional framework for thinking about variation across the animal kingdom in terms of consciousness profiles with, with several dimensions, rather than this idea of a single scale on which we might rank animals as being more or less conscious than each other. And we've been asking too, as Hero mentioned, questions about animal welfare and animal law and policy how should policymakers respond now to a complicated evidential picture, given our huge uncertainty about these issues? I think a really important idea in this context is the precautionary principle, often discussed in environmental contexts, discussed in relation to climate change, but I think we should discuss it in relation to sentience as well, and make sure we're not taking any reckless risks with systems that are potentially sentient in cases where we're not sure. So you know, I've written about that in the past. Last year, we produced a report that was commissioned by the UK government reviewing the evidence of sentience in some invertebrate animals, octopuses, crabs, lobsters, shrimps. And we ended up recommending that they receive at least a basic level of, of legal protection. And the government has ended up including them in the scope of a recent piece of animal welfare legislation called the Animal Welfare Sentience Act. And then this year we've been weighing in a bit about octopus farming. There's a lot of debate because some, some companies are really starting to aggressively attempt to farm octopuses. And we think that's an extremely bad idea for reasons we set out in this, this piece recently in the conversation. So lots of activity going on on all of these questions with, with a good sized team, including you know, these long-time collaborators like Heather Browning, Andrew Crump, Alex Schnell and uh, Nikki Clayton as well. It's been a real pleasure to work with Lars Chitka and many more. And if you want to read about any of this stuff, just go to our website there, linked on the slides. Now, you know, a general overview we I published recently with Heather uh, in Philosophy Compass called Animal Sentience. Now, today's topic now, when I give talks, I like to talk about whatever I'm working on currently, you know, whatever is, is new, not the stuff I've, I've just published. So today's topic is going to be something related, but a bit different. It's going to be about theories of consciousness and the distinction between so-called higher order theories and first order theories. Just a reminder there of the link to the slides, bit.ly slash 
Birch HOT if you want to bring up any of these slides. Now this first order versus higher order distinction has been very influential in the literature on consciousness. It's often seen as a common way of grouping different theories. Where a first order theory says that a, rep a representation, for example, a, a percept, a perceptual representation, can be consciously experienced. And when I talk about a representation being conscious, I mean it in the sense of it's being subjectively experienced, there being something it's like to have that experience, what philosophers sometimes call phenomenal consciousness, because of the phenomenal character of the state. First order theories say representations can be conscious in that sense without being the object of some other representation. For example, perhaps they just need to be globally broadcast, as the global workspace theory says. And that's often contrasted with higher order theories of consciousness that deny this and say that what makes a representation conscious in the sense of being subjectively experienced is that there's another representation of the right kind that takes the first representation as its object. Some kind of inner awareness, as it were, that is scanning around what is going on in the brain and what other things are being represented and that is taking as its object some of those perceptual representations of the world or body. So, for example, you know, Peter Carruthers, very important philosopher in the higher order tradition, puts it like this in the Stanford Encyclopedia. He says, higher order theories try to explain the relationship between unconscious and conscious mental states in terms of a relation obtaining between the conscious state in question and a higher order representation of some sort, either a higher order perception or a higher order thought about it. And three more of the influential theorists in the higher order tradition, Richard Brown, Hakuan Lau, Joe Ledoux, they put it like this, the basic idea of uh, higher order theories or, or HOT is that conscious experiences entail some minimal inner awareness of one's ongoing mental functioning. And this is due to the first order state being uh, monitored or meta represented by a relevant higher order representation. So there's a piece of received wisdom here. The received wisdom is this is a major fault line in our theorizing about consciousness, a major point of division. Um, both families, first order theory and higher order theories are diverse but they represent clearly delineated alternatives. And that's a piece of received wisdom that I've become skeptical of. I don't really believe it anymore. I, I mean, I used to think it, and now, now I don't. I think recent developments have put pressure on the idea of there being a major fault line here between clearly delineated alternatives. I think rather the boundary between the first order and higher order theories, the FOTs and the HOTs, has actually become so blurred in recent literature that we should start questioning the usefulness of that distinction at all. And so the rest of the talk will make a case for that claim. I mean, before going into the, the case for that claim, let's pause for a moment to reflect on its wider significance and its significance for some of those debates about animals that I started the talk with. Because it's often said that there's a very close connection between this first order versus higher order issue and animal consciousness. In fact, before I even started on this ERC project, um, I had a conversation with Dave Chalmers, I think in 2018, where he was saying to me, surely this is the crucial issue, isn't it? I mean, you've got to sort out this first order versus higher order thing before you can say anything about animals, because the facts about which animals are conscious will depend crucially on whether a first order view or a higher order view is correct. And I was sort of thinking, I don't really, I don't really see it that way, but I couldn't really explain why I didn't see it that way at the, at the time. And this talk will, will ultimately be my attempt to explain why I don't think this question is as important as, as um, some people have suggested. 
But anyway, it's certainly sometimes said that many more animals are likely to be conscious if a first order theory is correct. And you can intuitively see why that might be true. I mean, for sure, some specific members of the higher order family do lead to skepticism about animal consciousness. And Peter Carruthers has been um, very much in that tradition. He no longer endorses a higher order theory. He's still skeptical about animal consciousness, but not for reasons that have to do with endorsing a higher order theory, according to his latest book. But in the past, you know, 2000 and earlier, he was a very strong advocate of a higher order theory of consciousness. And he had a particular version of it that required a theory of mind module where the relevant higher order thoughts, the relevant inner awareness, as it were, is something that is generated by having a theory of mind module that evolved to help us attribute mental states to others and then turning it inwards onto ourself so that we're now attributing mental states to our to ourselves now that's one version of a higher order thought view on which it probably is you know if that were true very few other animals if any would be conscious i mean carruthers always found it unlikely that other animals possessed the relevant kind of module in the 80s this led him to some extraordinary uh claims about animals for example he said much time and money is presently spent on alleviating the pains of brutes that ought properly be directed towards human beings. Many are now campaigning to reduce the efficiency of modern farming methods because of the pain caused to the animals involved. If the arguments presented here have been sound, such activities are not only morally unsupportable, but morally objectionable. I mean, that's not, a view, that's not what he says now. That's not really a view that I think anyone really expresses openly anymore um and yet there must be a lot of people who still think this there must be in particular a lot of people sitting on company boards of farming companies who still think this because if they didn't why would they be allocating their resources in the way that they are so i think this view carruthers was expressing in the 80s it's not been cancelled it's a view that rules the world and deserves to be challenged but anyway, Carruthers' version of a higher order theory really did lead to scepticism about animal consciousness. And it's also true that some specific first order theories, like, for example, Michael Tice from the 90s, are taken by their advocates to imply wide distributions of consciousness. For example, Tai has long argued that bees are conscious. Um, you know, and I'm someone who takes that very seriously and thinks there's a very good chance that bees are conscious. There's, there's a very significant probability. Um, but even I don't say the kind of things Ty has said about this, because Ty really does seem very confident. He thinks we, we can really we can really know that bees are conscious because of his sympathy for first order theories. So that's led to this idea that first, you know, this issue is really important because if first order theories are, are correct, many animals are conscious, including bees. Whereas if higher order theories are true, maybe no animals are conscious except humans. I think that's always been a simplistic way of thinking about it. I think these have always been diverse families of theories, not monolithic entities. It's always been a little bit questionable to say hot implies few or no animals can be conscious. Fot implies many animals are conscious. But I think recent developments have, have made that even more questionable than it was before. And in fact, have put pressure on the very idea of there being a useful distinction here in the first place. So that's now the main argument of the talk is that two recent developments, when viewed together, rather than in isolation, put pressure on the idea of a clean first versus higher order distinction. Let's talk about the first development first. This is an argument from Nick Shea and Chris Frith for the claim that the global workspace needs metacognition. This was um, Trends in Cognitive Sciences 2019. So let's step back a little bit and explain what that claim means. The global workspace needs metacognition. Well, global workspace theory is one of the main best known theories of consciousness in, in the current 
field and posits, I, I see its core commitments as this, that conscious processing is a mechanism that integrates content from many different local processes, including different sensory processes and motor and evaluative and memory mnemonic and then broadcasts the integrated content back to the input systems and onwards to a wide range of consumer systems including systems of planning reasoning and decision making so it posits a very close relationship between conscious processing and cognitive access or what ned block called access consciousness the th essence of the theory is nicely captured in this diagram from uh, Dehan et al. Just gives you a sense of, you know, the global workspace is where everything comes together from many different local processes. It's where the whole brain gets on the same page. And then that content, that all on the same page content is then broadcast back and onwards. Something very attractive about this idea but now let's, let's ask, where do we place this in relation to the first order versus higher order distinction? Well, it's often described as being a canonical first order theory. For example, Carruthers thinks this. Carruthers, as I said, he used to defend a higher order theory. He now says he defends a first order view. And he says what's convinced him is the evidence for global workspace theory. Um, so he clearly sees global workspace theory as, as being first order. Why might we think this? Well, there's no inner awareness as such. If you think about that diagram, everything comes together, gets integrated, gets broadcast, but there's no step in which a sort of inner eye looks in and watches the show. You know, there's no role for an inner awareness mechanism in that picture. And Brown, Lau and Ledoux do agree with this. They say the inner awareness requirements of HOT distinguishes it from cognitive theories such as global workspace theory, which also invoke additional cognitive processes, but which don't posit inner awareness. For this reason, global workspace theory is a variant of first order theory. I think that's a widely held view. Shea and Frith, I see, is making an argument that puts a bit of pressure on this idea. Their basic argument is that for this mechanism to really work in the way described, there must be a metacognitive element to what is going on. So they say, well, what's, how's this mechanism supposed to work? The global workspace has the function of facilitating access related stuff, planning, reasoning, decision making. To do this, it needs to be broadcasting useful information information that is useful for planning, reasoning, and decision-making. Information that will lead our decisions in the right direction, not lead us astray. But then to be useful for these functions, contents need to come with associated confidence ratings that say not just what the content is, but also how likely this is to be accurate. I think there's I mean, their case is largely empirical, but I think there's also quite a lot of intuitive and phenomenological plausibility to that claim. I think about, for example, you see a bird in the, in the corner of your eye. Contrast that to a case where you see a bird in, in, in the center of you know, foveal vision. Now, there's a difference in subjective character between the visual experience in the two cases, you know, seeing a bird very, very clearly versus just catching it in the corner of your eye. But there's also a difference in the feeling of confidence. You now, in, in, in the foveal case, I see the bird and I have this feeling of very high confidence that it's a bird versus catch it in the corner of your eye. The, different, the experience has a different visual character but also the feeling of confidence isn't there for me i'm actually get this feeling of uncertainty was that a, was that a bird was it a plane was it superman I'm, I'm feeling very uncertain of course if you're a highly skilled bird watcher the visual character of the experiences may not significantly change but those feelings of confidence really do and you can build up a skill a perceptual skill so that you catch a bird in the corner of your eye and you're actually very confident about your identification of that bird. It's a skill I don't have. 
But in any case, you know, it very much does seem as though representations, when they come to consciousness, they come accomp accompanied by feelings of confidence. And Shea and Frith argue that that really has to be the case if these representations are going to inform good decision making. If it were not the case, I'd be making much worse decisions than if I have those feelings of, of confidence. And so they, they argue that part of the integrative function of a global workspace mechanism involves you know, not just broadcasting, but also the tagging and labeling of perceptual representations with consistent confidence ratings. Consistent in the sense that, well, it's no good if I'm you know, confident that there's a, a bird in peripheral vision and, and confident that there's not. You now the ratings have to be consistent. And so part of the role of the global workspace is to make sure that they are. They say we can think of an item in the workspace as representing something about the world and at the same time representing the accuracy of that representation. The content it makes globally available includes both aspects. So this is a, a, a little bit of movement in the direction of higher order from a canonical first order starting point. So you might read this paper and ask, wait, so is global workspace theory, if we accept this amendment, is it now a higher order theory? Has it switched sides? Well, no, it hasn't, say Shane Frith. This is not switching sides. Because importantly, they say, this metacognitive tagging with confidence ratings need not involve any re-representation. So there need not be any re-representing, forming a new representation of the original content, such as there's a bird in the sky. And they say this is crucially different from metacognitive accounts of consciousness put forward by higher order theories, because there's no, there's no re-representation, there's no redrawing of that original content from scratch. The representations in the workspace, they say, carry a, a built-in or linked confidence rating akin perhaps to the metadata that we come across you know, when we're looking at spreadsheets and PDFs and things in, in, in libraries. Familiar idea that data must come with metadata to be useful. And their argument is that representations in the global workspace have this, this built-in or linked metadata but are not the objects of a distinct representation. So there's still no inner eye or inner awareness looking in. There's just built-in metadata. That's development one, putting a bit of pressure on first order, higher order distinction by introducing a metacognitive element to what's traditionally been seen as a first order theory, global workspace theory. Development two is Hakuan Lau's theory is perceptual reality monitoring theory that receives its, its clearest statement so far in his recent book, In Consciousness We Trust, a, a book, by the way, that I think is really good and a really good entry point to the, the current controversies around um, studying consciousness scientifically. So bearing in mind everything I've said about Shay and Frith and remembering the link, bit.ly slash birch hot if you want to uh, to go back to any of that let's think about this second development Lau is offering a new member of the higher order family as he sees it one in which conscious sensory content is not re-represented but only tagged as reliable so it's taking away from traditional higher order theories the element of re-representing the original sensory content and replacing it with the kind of tagging. The basic idea is that perceptual representations are being monitored, not by a, an inner eye exactly, that's forming its own representations, but rather by a discriminator mechanism, similar to those already developed in, in machine learning, where this discriminator has the task of essentially sorting the perceptual representations to try and work out which one's a signal and which one's a noise. In fact, it's a little bit more complicated than that because it's not just signal versus noise in Lau's theory, it's externally triggered signal, like bird is in the sky, versus internally generated content. So 
I imagined there was a bird in the sky. I, I, I hallucinated there was a bird in the sky or just pure, pure noise. There was nothing there. Certainly when, when I go out at night, I get all kinds of noise in my visual field. Um, some of it bears a passing resemblance to birds, but I, I don't have any feeling of confidence that it is a bird. In fact, I'm very confident that it's, that it's not. So the discriminator mechanism is trying to sort you know, changes in the world from internally generated content from, from noise. Now, interestingly, this mechanism for Lao is implicit, subpersonal, automatic. To me, this marks uh, another potential point of difference with more traditional theories in the higher order family, where explicit thought seems to be important. But Lau is quite insistent that you know you have your explicit reflecting on your experiences and thinking about them, and that can dissociate from this perceptual reality monitoring, which is implicit, subpersonal, and automatic. And in fact, that leads to one of the the most appealing features of the view, which is the account of lucid dreaming. Inter you know, lucid dreaming is then interpreted as a case in which the implicit, subpersonal, automatic reality monitoring is telling you this is all real, this is all reliable, but your explicit reflection on what you're experiencing is telling you it's not. And the, the rarity of that dissociation explains the rarity of lucid dreaming, according to, to Lau, which I think is, is a fantastic uh, idea. So this is, you know, is moving a lot from the traditional higher order view, inner awareness, higher order thought, in the direction of something much more implicit, subpersonal, automatic monitoring um, and, and tagging of perceptual representations. There's no re-representation here. There's no taking of the perceptual representation and redrawing, forming a new representation. Rather, the perceptual states are simply referred to by an indexing or addressing system. So this discriminator is saying, well, the perceptual content that is at this address in the visual cortex, that's real. The, the content that is at this address, that's just noise. It's referring to them by addresses, not by re-representing. That's another crucial part of the view. As Lau puts it, the higher order state does not duplicate the first order content, but merely serves as a gating mechanism to direct the first order information to the relevant downstream processes. Also another very interesting aspect of the view that I think Lao uh, plays down in the book, but that struck me when I was reading it as very creative, is that there may be a form of time tagging as well. So it's the contents not just being tagged as this is real or this is noise, but also this is happening now versus this is happening in the past or this may happen in the future. So in that case where I just see a bird in the sky in the center of my foveal vision, and I'm really confident it's a bird, that also gets tagged as this is happening right now. Um, the bird is there now. It's not in memory, it's not in the future. It's there right now. So I see this as a convergence from a very different direction, from very much a higher order starting point towards a picture that is somewhat similar to that of Shea and Frith in certain ways. Remember the Shea and Frith picture is about representations in the global workspace having built-in metadata, built-in confidence tags. This is now start with the, the basic higher order idea, the in awareness idea, and posit that maybe it just involves these implicit subpersonal automatic tagging processes where representations are referred to by an address and the representation at that address is tagged as reliable. So you might ask, well, you know, hang on, is this actually a version of the global workspace uh, view now? Lau says it's not. He says, no, it isn't, because when the discriminator decides that a first order representation correctly represents the world right now, global broadcast and access are likely to happen but these consequences are not constitutively part of the subjective experience, according to this view. So the view is one on which uh, global broadcast is a likely consequence of the tagging process he's describing, 
likely but not inevitable, doesn't always happen, we sometimes get subjectively experienced content that is not globally broadcast. So there is still a difference with the global workspace view. But still, you know, these two recent developments, this you know, global workspace needs metacognition argument and the perceptual reality monitoring theory strike me as convergence from two different directions on a common theme, namely the importance of what we might call metacognitive curation of perceptual states. Now, curation, just like we talk about data curation, the, um, the tagging of data with good metadata. Librarians absolutely love it. It's, it's a big part of the job, curation. This metacognitive curation of perceptual states, especially forms of confidence and accuracy tagging. This is probably happening. This is probably noise. This is probably externally generated. This is probably internally generated. Also, I think really interestingly, this is, this is right now. This is in the recent past. This is the distant past. This is a possible future. You can think of all of, all of these adding of tags to our perceptual states as stuff that happens very fast, implicitly, subpersonally, automatically. Think of it all under the heading of metacognitive curation. We're seeing convergence from different directions on the importance of metacognitive curation to conscious experience. Now that leads, of course, to a, a terminological issue about where to place metacognitive curation in relation to that old distinction between first and higher order. And actually, there's no uncontroversial thing to say here, because if, if we're going to say that metacognitive curation is genuinely higher order, it genuinely counts as a very simple form of inner awareness, then, uh, then the Shea and Frith version of global workspace theory is higher order, despite what they say. And in, uh, by the same token, if we insist that metacognitive curation is not enough, it's not really inner awareness, it's something less than that, it's still first order, then Lau's perceptual reality monitoring theory has to be counted as first order. So, you know, contrary to what he says. So on the terminological issue, someone is going to be annoyed either way because there's no there's no uncontroversial way to, to sort these metacognitive curation processes in relation to the first versus higher order distinction but i think eh, crucially that terminological issue just doesn't matter it's it's purely terminological in the pejorative sense it, it doesn't really matter to our theorizing about consciousness it's better to say that both of these pictures combine elements of earlier first order and higher order views in a way that actually blurs that traditional distinction and challenges the usefulness of it. It seemed really clear, really important, but now we're starting to see it's not so important. It's not so clear. The interesting views are in the middle because they're positing forms of metacognitive curation that don't fall unambiguously on either side. I think the real lesson of these two developments I've been talking about is that the first versus higher order distinction, granting that maybe it was tracking a major fault line in our theorizing about consciousness in the 90s and 80s, is no longer really tracking a major fault line in theorizing about consciousness. Instead, theorists are converging from different directions around forms of metacognitive curation of perceptual states that, you know, on the one hand, neither leave the content wholly unchanged as mere broadcasting would. So if you think about that, you know, seeing the bird in, in foveal versus peripheral vision, the content is not wholly unchanged when that confidence tag is added. It's subjectively different to feel really confident that there's a bird there versus to be very uncertain. The content's not wholly unchanged. It's not mere broadcasting, but nor is there re-representing of the content from scratch, where that, you know, represent, the representation that gets experienced and gets tagged is the representation that is formed by the visual system 
in visual cortex, there's no re-representing of the content from scratch, as in the traditional higher order thought picture. I mean, I think this is a welcome trend. I think it's a good thing. Of course, it's one thing to say there is a trend and another thing to evaluate it positively or negatively. And some people might be, you know, tearing their hair out saying this is a this is a step backward. But I think it's welcome and a promising way forward because I think that you know, metacognitive curation views of consciousness have key advantages over the hard line views on both sides. If you think of hard line first order theories that say the representation is completely unchanged, no curation, versus the hard line higher order view that says it's re-represented um, in prefrontal cortex, so the original representation formed by the visual system in, in, in uh, visual cortex is no longer determining the content of the experience constitutively, those views will always be wrestling with certain kinds of challenges that will make them quite unattractive. I think the, the hardline first order view will always have to be wrestling with the problem of the relative uselessness of uncurated representation, data with no metadata, the content that comes with no information about how likely it is to be signal versus noise, um, really there versus not really there versus the apparent usefulness of consciousness. Now, some people may dispute that, but I'm, I'm really pretty convinced that something as extraordinarily complicated and energetically expensive and hard to maintain as conscious experience must be performing extremely useful functions for organisms. And I think it's very plausible that there are extremely important functions relating to decision making the conscious experience is helping us with and that'll always be you know put the hard line first order view in a bit of a bind because you're insisting that representation that is in a relatively useless format uncurated is nonetheless serving this incredibly important central function in our mental lives meanwhile you now i think these middle ground views of advantages over the traditionalist hard line higher order views as well so those views always have to wrestle with the wastefulness of re-representing content from scratch. I mean, the, the visual system and other perceptual systems generating all this content about the world and about our bodies. And then the, at some level, the hard line higher order view is that that, that content is just a write-off. At some point, you've just got to start again and say, let's form a new representation of the world or the body to which this first order stuff is causally relevant it's a source of information but it's not constitutively involved there's always going to be you're going to be rubbing up against the basic challenge that that it seems like a wasteful architecture compared to one that simply curates the first order representations to get the maximum informational value out of them Middle paths of the sort Lau and Shea and Frith are converging towards uh, avoid both of those problems. And I think that makes them fundamentally more attractive than the hard line views on either side. So I think there's not just a trend here, but the trend is a welcome one. Now, of course, you know, Shea and Frith and Lau don't agree about everything. But it's just that the, the fault line that separates them um, I see is not one that is naturally posed in terms of first versus higher order. It's rather that they're disagreeing about a different question. You know, they both agree about the importance of metacognitive curation to conscious experience. And that's a big point of agreement. But they disagree about something else, namely the question, is metacognitive curation sufficient by itself? Now, if you've got this perceptual reality monitoring that is that is sorting the representations, real external, real internal, just noise, um, is that sufficient for the representation to be consciously experienced? Or are you still missing something? That's a real point of disagreement where Lau says, uh, yes, it is sufficient. No, you don't need the content to be broadcast. So even if it's not broadcast, it's still consciously experienced. 
Whereas, you know, a true global workspace theorist cannot agree with that. They have to say broadcasting is also required. So there's a genuine point of disagreement there. You know, informally, what is the status of your edited but unused footage? It's been, it's gone into the camera. It's then been appropriately tagged and curated as reliable or not, but it was never broadcast. It was never aired, never got to the global workspace. What's the status of that? Is it subjectively experienced or is it not? Is it pre-conscious but not conscious? Is it, is it part of the material on which consciousness draws or is it conscious in its own right? Now that's an incredibly difficult question to answer. It's a question that um, connects to debates about overflow that have been running for years with no agreed experimental methodology to settle them. So there's a real point of disagreement there among people who agree about the importance of metacognitive curation. And it's a really hard one to ever settle. But for my purposes here, I, I, I'm not claiming to settle that question. I think the main point to, to take away is that you know, that question that separates these views is, is not one about first versus higher order. It's a different question. Um, a fundamentally different question about whether metacognitive creation is sufficient by itself or whether broadcasting is also required. So the disagreements are taking on a different character. The fault lines are appearing in different places. All right, so in, in closing, I want to go back to animals because I said this debate about first versus higher order theories is, is not just interesting in its own right. It also has this wider significance for animals because it's sometimes been suggested and if you were reading the 90s literature you definitely get that impression that first versus higher order is the big issue in relation to which animals are, are conscious if it's if first order theories are correct then many animals including bees are in the in the club the consciousness club as it were but if it's uh, higher order then maybe only only humans let's go back to that claim then and reassess it in light of the pressure I've been putting on the very idea of a first versus higher order distinction. I mean that claim was always questionable, said earlier, it's, you know, always questionable because of the diversity of the two families. But it now seems I think even more questionable than it was before and I think in fact the first versus higher order distinction isn't able to carry the sort of weight that that claim expects it to carry. That claim is taking it for granted that this first order versus higher order distinction carries really big theoretical weight. And I don't think that's the case. So I think it's a, an ill-formed claim. In fact, let's think about those theories we've been discussing from, from Shea and Frith and from Val. It's really not obvious at all, I would suggest, that modern theories in the global workspace family imply a wider distribution of consciousness than modern uh, metacognitive theories descended from earlier higher order theories like Lau's perceptual reality monitoring view. I mean, recall here that that monitoring is not about explicit thought. It is not about a person with, with language thinking that's a bird um, explicitly. Uh, it's not that at all. The monitoring is implicit, subpersonal, automatic. Informally one might say it's, it's under the hood. It's not something one can simply reflect upon and think, uh, oh yes of course I, I, I recognize that as reliable and that as noise. Accordingly I think it's not implausible to think the metacognition that is involved in tagging representations with confidence ratings or accuracy ratings or with uh, time tags now or in the past. It's plausible that this is very minimal and very widely shared. I think it's even possible that it's a basic precondition for flexible decision making in complex environments. Recall my example of the bird in, you know, seen clearly in foveal vision versus seen out of the corner of your eye and the importance of having a feeling of confidence and not just the experience of the bird. 
it's important because it lets us make decisions flexibly and adaptively in complex environments where we're trying to hunt things and stuff is out to get us and we need to make good decisions very quickly. Those challenges are fundamentally there for a very wide range of animals. And so there's an ecological um, reason for thinking these sorts of mechanisms would be very widely shared. Lau has a really quick discussion of this in the book. He says, I'm inclined to think, he says there's not enough evidence, but I'm inclined to think that most mammals capable of sensory predictive processing and metacognition are probably having some simple conscious experiences. And he doesn't want to really commit to which animals those are, but he's open to, to it being very widely shared among mammals, including rats and other rodents. But it's really not clear that there's good evidence against the presence of these PRM style mechanisms in other animals, as I see it. It's really more that there's a, a gaping lack of evidence, just a colossal evidence gap. You know, I mean, when we look for what evidence is there regarding metacognition, it's often the case that where researchers have seriously looked, they found evidence of it existing. And strikingly, that's the case for bees. There was this paper by Perry and Barron in 2013 looking for evidence of metacognition in bees, specifically uncertainty monitoring, where bees are given uh, you know, a task where there's some pots of food contain sugar solution, which they love, and some of the pots contain quinine, which they absolutely hate. And they're given a stimulus that tells them which of the pots contains um, sugar and which contains quinine. And then the task is made incrementally more difficult. In the Perry and Barron version, it was about the orientation of a, the relative uh, position of, of two stimuli where in the easy version, one is clearly higher than the other, and that's the one with the sugar. And then they make it harder and harder by moving them closer and closer together until they're virtually level. And then you know, the question is, do the bees opt out of the task more often as the task becomes more difficult? And the evidence from the paper is that they do. So you know, they argue this is evidence of uncertainty monitoring that the bee is monitoring not just what the stimuli are but how confident it is of which one being higher that's not quite uh, the full mechanism of perceptual reality monitoring is in Lau's theory uh, for sure i mean it's sort of it's just monitoring uncertainty but you know the, there's a mechanism there that makes it seem like a serious possibility, seems like a question worth asking, seems like it would be worth looking for perceptual reality monitoring in, in, in bees and that it's not an absurd proposition. And we certainly can't say that the absence of language in bees precludes the absence of PRM. So we, here's a closing thought that you know, I suggested a few minutes ago that the, the emerging new fault line is not first versus higher order but granting the importance of metacognitive curation to conscious experience, is it already sufficient, even without any broadcasting, as Lau suggests, or is global broadcasting also required? And I said that was a very hard question to settle. It's really interesting to think about that though in relation to animals, that there will be disagreements about which animals are, are conscious given that fault line but they won't go in the in the way that we traditionally expected you know there's this traditional expectation that global workspace theories are, are first order so they'll imply a wide distribution theories that are higher order will imply a narrow distribution and that received wisdom is just wrong we might even get a sort of reversal here because if that's the real point of disagreement then it's really the global workspace theories that are positing an additional requirement, one that fewer animals may meet. There may be animals that have the relevant types of metacognition without having global broadcasting. And so it might be that the PRM type views end up implying a wider distribution of consciousness in the, in the natural world than the global workspace views. 
especially if you think about animals that have limited interhemispheric con connectivity or substantial decentralization of the nervous system. It's often been observed that birds, for example, lack a corpus callosum or an analog of the corpus callosum connecting the two hemispheres, suggesting perhaps a greater degree of independence between those hemispheres than we find in mammals. Now there's not a lot evident not a lot of evidence one way or the other on that and it seems to depend on the task and the regions of the visual field that are being probed. For some regions of the visual field in some species of bird you really do seem to get big dissociations where something that can be learned and done very skillfully by one hemisphere on stimuli in one half of the visual field just can't be done at all on stimuli presented in the other half. If you're a global workspace theorist, that might worry you because you might think, well, how could they really, if there's substantial uh, autonomy of the two hemispheres, that really limits the extent to which there can be truly global broadcasting. But on the other hand, there could still be a huge amount of uh, metacognitive curation going on um, without the global broadcasting. Similarly, if you think about octopuses, there you get, um, fascinating patterns of decentralization that are very poorly understood. There's the central brain and then there's the eight individual arms and there's also a nerve ring connecting the eight arms through pathways that don't via the brain. And the question of how much of what octopuses do is, is, is outsourced to the um, arms and the connections between the arms outside of the brain versus how much is controlled by the brain is very much up for debate. But you can imagine how it could potentially be another case where you get a lot of metacognition going on, despite the absence of any um, genuine global broadcasting. It's a speculation, but it, you know, it's a speculation that illustrates a conceptual point, namely that the received wisdom that the theories traditionally grouped with the first order ones are going to imply wider distributions of consciousness in the natural world is just not really true anymore. In fact, it's all going to depend on the details in ways that we uh, currently are not in a position to really confidently adjudicate. So, I mean, on that note, I think we're still in this position of uh, wondering about octopuses, cuttlefish, crabs. Still think we're in the position where we can say there's a serious enough possibility of consciousness to not do horrible things to them and protect their welfare and not drop them in boiling water. And uh, those, those ethical views remain uh, constant independently of all my uncertainty about the correct theory of consciousness. And uh, I'll stop there and thanks very much for your attention. If you want the, uh, to look at what's going on in our project, the, the link is on the slide there. And if you want the slides, it's bit.ly slash birchhot. Thanks very much.